Let me do a, a, just a brief recap of the year because that's what people are asking me about right now with commencement upon us. And we're about to graduate a, another great group of, of young Hawkeyes in the next few days, starting tomorrow morning with pharmacy and all the way through the weekend. So it's an exciting time, obviously, on campus to see all the great students that I've had the pleasure, many of which I've had the pleasure of getting to know and working with um, over the last three, four, five years now. Um, watching them graduate is bittersweet, uh, always. Always. But hearing what their plans are is very exciting to someone like me, knowing that, that so many of them do have plans or so many of them are in the process of figuring out what they're going to do post-graduation. So it's a great time. It's, it's kind of um, chaotic, obviously, in town and on campus. The students are moving out of the residence halls now and moving out of town and, and some of them moving away. And at the same time, we're getting ready for graduation to... to uh, um, commence right away. Uh, as I reflect back on the year and I reflect back on our students, one of the things that I think I'm most proud of this year in particular is the way our students have responded to the issue of sexual assault on campus. Without a doubt, um, they are stepping up to the plate. They are helping the administration, myself included, deal with this very, very challenging issue. And I'm proud of the way in which they have stepped up to take some responsibility and to take some leadership and to really make some serious efforts um, in dealing with these these tough issues. So from my perspective, um, watching the students this year, watching how they do their business and how they respond to things on campus, I could not be more proud of our students. Um, obviously we've got a lot going on right now with all the flood recovery all the buildings that are being built on the the, the campus all of the things that are happening that um, people like myself have waited six years to see <laughs> it, it's gratifying finally to see that so i'm very pleased about the way we're now making very tangible obvious progress in terms of flood recovery and that in a very short time now in just two years um, we're going to have the new facilities for art and music. We're going to have the new Hancher Auditorium. Uh, not a flood project, but we're going to have a new children's hospital as well. And just a little over a year from now, we're going to have a new residence hall, which is something that we haven't had on this campus in almost 45 years. So very exciting in terms of the physical transformation of our campus. And I think that physical transformation is really now going to allow us to begin to think seriously about some things that we haven't been able to think about, including growth. Um, and this plays into some of the um, Regents initiatives that are going on right now, the performance-based funding model, the uh, efficiency study that Deloitte is doing for us. And I want to just say a few things about those because I think it's important. Uh, the performance-based funding committee has made some recommendations going forward, and I think these recommendations are very deserving of, of considerable discussion especially in view of um, the University of Iowa and what I think is our particularly unique mission. One of the things that sometimes can get lost in the conversation is how important our graduate and professional programs are. Uh, and I think that what we have to do is make certain that uh, our, our regents hear from us that those programs not only are important, but they're also expensive. Um, and that Iowa kids who are in medical school deserve consideration in the performance-based funding model just the way undergraduate students at all of the region's institutions deserve consideration. And that it does cost a lot more to deliver medical education or dental education or certain types of health sciences education in particular than it does um, for what I would call the standard liberal arts undergraduate education. So, you know, that's one point that I think we have to really emphasize because it does set us apart from other institutions within the state. And I think in a good way, I think in a positive way. And I think in a way that benefits Iowa very positively as a state because imagine a community where you didn't have doctors, where you didn't have pharmacists, where you didn't have dentists. It wouldn't be a very healthy community. It wouldn't probably be a community that was sustainable long term. So it's important for us to, to make our points and make sure that the regents understand that um, we have a unique P 
piece to our mission that is worthy of further discussion and further, further consideration. Um, I remember when we started um, on the path to performance-based funding, the promises made by the leadership of the Board of Regents at that time that uh, were that the object was to do no harm to any of the institutions. And um, really, the only way that I um, see potential for doing harm would be to ignore the mission and the difference in the missions of the three institutions. So I'm hopeful that we can continue to have a positive discussion about the importance of mission differentiation as well as differentiation of what it costs to deliver certain types of education. Um, that said, I think with uh, several years to implement a, a new model, I think what you can expect to see is that the University of Iowa will start to grow now. Uh, new residence hall coming online. This is a good time to think about growth for the future. Uh, we're going to work hard, obviously, to be sure we're an attractive option for every Iowa student. Uh, and we're going to work hard to continue to be an attractive option to our non-resident students as well because they're important to our diversity and our student body and really to the global nature of what we try to do as an institution. Um, I had the op opportunity turning now to the efficiency study. Uh, I had the opportunity yesterday to sit down with um, the, the principals from Deloitte and we had a good conversation about some of the early findings that they're beginning to consider and some of the opportunities that will be there for the university to become more efficient. Um, for me, more efficient means finding um, savings that we can reinvest in the primary mission, which is academics, which is making sure that we continue to have the high quality academic programs. So I'm, I continue to be excited by the opportunities I think that might be there. It's nice to have someone from the outside come in with sort of fresh eyes and take a look to see what we're doing to give us comments on how we're doing it and to give us advice on how we can do it better in the future. And I think that's where we're headed with this. So um, those, are, those are really the big things right now that, uh, that plus fundraising. I, I just spent the last few days, I spent yesterday in Dubuque, the day before in Davenport with uh, alumni groups and uh, we continue to do very, very well on the fundraising front and I'm very pleased about that because that's really um, one of the things that will make a big difference in the future for the University of Iowa. A lot of what we're raising are scholarships for students, professorships, the kinds of things that really play into the student success models that we're building on here today. So, Great. Um, so to talk a little bit about Deloitte, you said you sat uh -huh. down with them yesterday. Yeah. Um, yeah. What were some of the more specific recommendations that they kind of made to you? They didn't have specific recommendations yet. They're still working on the specifics of it, but generally, um, we talked about opportunities in areas like operations and finance, um, uh, IT, some of the bigger areas. And I think next week when they sit down with the regents and some of the uh, administrative officials that they'll have a, a few more details to add. Uh, I think it was uh, the message I got was that where there probably aren't opportunities were in the power plant. Um, in food services, you know, outsourcing food services while it's an attractive option. What they said to us yesterday, and I kind of pushed them on this, was that it really didn't make sense in terms of finances, in terms of saving money, that in fact you're already looking for good ways to be more efficient in terms of food utilization and that sort of thing. It wasn't necessarily going to save you a lot of money to outsource it to some other group that would do food, food services for you. So that was interesting. Um, and I think there were a few other smaller things like that where clearly they're suggesting that it doesn't make sense to look deeper there, but they've got bigger areas where they think there's a lot of opportunity where we can look for savings, not only internally within our own system, but uh, across the three regions institutions. And I think that makes um, very good sense. So. Um, yeah. And so mm -hmm. I know you talked a little bit about the performance-based revenue um, model task force. Right, and right, so yeah. you talked a little bit about how you have to speak with um, the regents and the group and talk about how, you know, there's different costs for different programs. Absolutely. What will you do specifically to kind of present those differences? 
Um, well, I'm going to be um, speaking with regents individually, and then um, hopefully they'll have a good discussion at the Board of Regents meeting, meeting in June and include this as a topic. Um, I'm hoping they'll ask for more information. I'm hoping that they'll want to hear more from us in terms of what the real costs are. Now, they have a lot of that information that they can go back to, and I think it's important that we get that on the table as a topic of further discussion for them. Do you so. feel that it's something that hasn't been um, expressed as much in the past? Do you feel that that might be a reason why they might be overlooking at that at this time? You know, I, I don't think they've overlooked it. I think they've undervalued it from my particular viewpoint uh, at this point. And so I want to try to make a, a stronger case on the value of and the cost of graduate and professional education, and especially in the areas of the health sciences. So. Um, and obviously, I, I know our graduate professional students have been making the argument as well. And we're going to continue to do that. Since we're the only one of the three institutions that really has the full breadth of graduate professional programs, it's really our issue. So not surprisingly, it's not an issue that is necessarily of, of uh, great conversation on the other, com uh, on the other campuses. Mm -hmm. They have different pressures than we do. Mm -hmm. Um, and have you worked with any uh, graduate or professional officials from the colleges to kind of communicate those needs? With the the, I work closely with the, the student government leaders. So the leadership of our graduate um, student government, graduate professional student government, that's who I've been working with. And they've been great partners in this. <coughs> they also get a chance to meet with regents at every regents meeting. So they've been really good and vocal uh, proponents for the kinds of things that I'm talking about, which I think is terrific. Once um, again, our students step up. <laughs> yeah. And so talking, you spoke yeah. a little bit about um, the issue of sexual assault this yeah. year yeah. and how um, obviously yeah. the six-point plan was released in March. Yeah. Um, what do you think have been kind of the successes of the program thus far? Well, um, we've made progress on every point in those six points. Joe can certainly give you more information on each one of those. I was very pleased at how responsive every office and every group on campus has been. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, uh, plenty more work to do. And I think the students are now beginning to realize what I told them at the outset, which is the hard part of this work is that we get to start over again every year with a new group of students who come in and they're not aware. Uh, they're, in fact, in need of education on these particular issues. And we need to be certain that we get the right kinds of education to them, and they become partners with us going forward as well. So that's going to be one of our big challenges, and I think uh, as I've talked to Grant and other members of the student task force, um, they're ready. They're ready to help us, and I think we can make some progress. Um, so. Will that work be primarily sort of <coughs> pause in the summer, or with, will the task force meet in the summer? Um, you know, that's up to them since it's a, it's a pretty diverse group of students, but we were careful to put students on the task force that we knew weren't graduating this May. So there is the opportunity, if they're going to be around this summer, certainly there is the opportunity to meet. Um, and we're more than happy to, to make sure that if they're here and ready to do it, that it can happen. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about kind of where the funding for these types of programs might come from? Um, you know, different sources, um, more, more likely central funding, in other words, funding from the, the either provost or president's offices, these kinds of things where I can make some funds available on a, a short-term basis to do certain kinds of things, and then we can build the funding into the university budget going forward if it's something that we'll continue to do as we go forward. If we're going to just try it out as an experiment, we'll give one-time funding, and then if it's an experiment that works, We'll look for the continued funding. So, okay. And then yeah. I looked at the plan a little specifically. Mm -hmm. um, looked into one of the things you mentioned were the campus walks. Right. I was wondering right. kind of what the progress was on that. Yeah. Specifically. I believe there have been several of those at this point in time, but I think that's something that's still not yet. I, I don't know specifically. I'm yeah. Sorry. Okay. But we can find out okay. exactly where they are. Okay. But that's something that we wanted to do with the students before they left campus. So. My understanding is I think that there have been a couple of those, but there's more that will need to be done, especially given the transformation of the campus. 
you know, as we do all these construction projects, we're going to have to revisit this on a regular basis to make sure that a construction project hasn't created a new set of issues for us going forward. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, and yeah. then um, kind of once this is, so to speak, completed, obviously looking a little <laughs> bit further down this the road. This is never completed. Um, <laughs> once you kind of feel that yeah. you're moving forward with this, yeah. kind of what's the next step? Will you present this to the regents? Kind of what do you, what will you move forward? Well, we'll, we'll, you know, I, I, if the regents uh, would like, we'll give them regular reports, and I'll certainly ask them if, if that's their desire. Uh, it may be regular reports that are orally presented to the regions. It may be in their agenda, so maybe a written report that they'll each get to read. Uh, but we'll keep them apprised, obviously, of progress that we're making. Um, but even more importantly, I want to keep the campus apprised. So, you know, I want our students to understand what it is we're doing. I want the faculty and staff to understand what we're doing. So as I work with the shared governance groups, I'll be sharing information with them as I get it on how we're making progress in these areas. So, and obviously happy to share with the DI when we have it too, so, yeah. Um, and then talking a little bit about yeah. some flood recovery stuff, I know you mentioned yeah. all the construction going on. Yeah. Um, the theater building just kind of talked about the some of the major work they're gonna be doing this summer. Yeah. Um, how will those displaced um, from the building, namely the theater building, as I mentioned, operate yeah. and kind of where do you think that will Well, that's place? why we're doing it this summer. Is That's usually when there's at least fewer people around. And um, they've been displaced before. <laughs> it was much worse during the flood where we didn't have a place to put. There were trailers for them. So I think, you know, at this point we're trying very hard to manage these projects so it creates the least disruption to the academic programs. And um, uh, it's not easy, because it's not like we have a lot of extra space. And that, that's that been the problem since the flood. And it's been one of the problems that we've faced in terms of, uh, you know, I talked about, uh, we saw an increase in enrollment of about 500 students the year of the flood. So we had the flood in the summer of 2008. We had 500 additional students come to campus in the fall of 2008. And that was extremely stressful. And it's part of the reason why we've managed to, and we've worked hard to manage to keep enrollment stable for those last five or six years, because what were we going to do if we grew more? Where would we put them, given that we were, we had damaged buildings, we had just destroyed buildings, and we knew we were going to have to do something significant to be able to recover from the flood. Now that all of that is in front of us and it's happening, now we can start to think about what the future is and what we should look like as a university going forward. And I think growth is in our future. Um, what yeah. kind of growth specifically? Um, well, probably growth uh, as much as anything on the undergraduate side. So we'll be a larger university uh, in the future. And I'd like to do this in a, in a very planned and controlled way so that it's not thousands of students all at once coming to campus that we can do this in a way so that uh, um, it's uh, manageable. And that's going to take some careful planning. So, Great. Well, the last kind of yeah. question I had, I know we had one question, um, but are there any other plans or projects beyond this summer that students, staff, and faculty returning can expect to see in the fall? In terms of, of uh, changes to the physical face of campus, that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. The ones that are underway right now are, are obviously going to continue to occupy a lot of time. Uh, in terms of new ones, the pharmacy building is probably the new one that people will begin to see happen as they come back um, next fall. And it won't be dramatic yet. In other words, there won't be a huge hole in the ground. We won't be tearing down another building just yet. But uh, that's the next project in line. That's the next one that's going to start, and that's probably where... Uh, you're going to start to see things as well. So, anything else? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah. I have one question. I actually uh -huh. have a second if we have time. It's more of a it's okay. more of a revelation question. We got four, I'll go, we I'll do go it. as quickly as yeah. I can. Yeah. My first question is <coughs> sort of just something I was curious about. I know you haven't mm -hmm. made a public comment on it yet, but I know that the UI decided that it was not in the best interest to allow girls the HBO series to film on campus. Mm -hmm. I know that the director has expressed that they still intend to film in Iowa City just to avoid campus. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, is that something that matters to you guys? But secondly, is it an issue you stand by, or do you do you or would you revisit it? That's that's kind of my question. 
I'm not intending to revisit it. I think Joe did a very good job for us of, of uh, reaching out to them, um, saw the script, read the script, and decided that it really wasn't in the best interest of the University of Iowa. Um, and I respect that. I agree with it. And going forward, uh, you know, the producers and, and of the show can do what they need to do, but um, not with our help. Sure. So. And the last question I have, I'm graduating. Yeah. I'm really excited yeah. to be an alumnus and to look back at Iowa. You know, yeah. I, grew, I grew up in Iowa. My little brother's going to be a freshman here next year. And Excellent. So this, is, this is sort of a weird question, but one of yeah. the things, I'm, I'm going to live the next four years vicariously through him because I'm not ready to leave. <laughs> and sort of one of the things that I wanted to ask was, in four years when he's graduating, when he's in my position, you know, mm -hmm. three or four days from graduating, what do you expect or what do you hope is the same at the University of Iowa and what do you hope is different? Hmm, those are good questions. Um, what I hope is the same is that he's going to leave with the same feeling that you have, which is he doesn't want to leave, that he had a great experience here, that it's been uh, worth every penny, that it is uh, really the launching pad, obviously, for his life. Um, what's likely going to be different is, is we will be bigger. Um, there will be more students here. Um, we will have these new facilities that will be done. He will probably, depending on his major, he will at least have been in Hancher Auditorium. You've never seen Hancher Auditorium. You've never seen the basement of the Student Union. You didn't realize the bookstore was down there. He'll, he'll get his books and his materials in the basement of the Student Union, and you won't have had that opportunity. So it's going to be a very different experience for him in some senses, but I hope a very similar experience in that he leaves here a proud alum and feeling like it was the best experience of his life so far. The great thing for me is I get to talk to, and I've done this for the last two days in, in Dubuque and Davenport, so many of our alums who graduated, oh, two years ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, and it's the same story every time. It hasn't, that hasn't changed over the years. It was the best experience of my life, and it doesn't matter whether they graduated here in 1950 or in 2014. And that's a great, great legacy. That should never change. So. That's all I have. Thank, Thank you. you. That's a great way to end. Thank you. Yeah.